Chandler, how, how are you playing on this Thursday, I guess it is? Uh, it's a pretty good Thursday. Um, yeah, yeah, for Thursday, it's going pretty well, so I can't complain too much. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just always busy, always working, so. Okay. How about how about yourself? I'm good. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's good. I'm ready for the 90-degree day to be here. Dude, you know, I'm I'm originally from Denver, and so it being it's like I think it was like 75 or something the other day there, and I'm just tired. I'm tired of sweating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. I is like I I had so I grew up in Alabama and then lived before I moved here. I spent the last 12 years in uh in Northern California. So I got super small then. That's like Denver territory, right? Where it's perfect yeah. weather. You know, you're used to being like 75 um, degrees every day or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, it was a rude awakening coming back to the you know the heat and humidity. Um, okay, well I think I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so for everybody watching, uh, just so you know, I am Michael Warman. I'm a project coordinator with the Ethical Network of San Antonio, and I'm joined by. Yanni Medin of Grain for Grain. Did I say that right? Did I get your last name correct? You said it right, man. You're uh, one of the few, the proud. Okay, perfect. Good. I was worried about that. I'm glad I got it right. Um, so uh, what I want to start with you, Yanni, is just um, tell me a little bit about you and kind of your origin story and what you were doing before Grain for Grain. How, like, and then how did you wind up doing that? Yeah, um, sweet. That's a yeah, that's a, a loaded story. So I'll, I'll try and keep it like relatively brief. But uh, so I'm, I'm born and raised in Denver. Uh, my family's immigrants. Uh, my my parents are immigrants from Ethiopia. Um, so uh, yeah, loved loved the mountains. Loved Denver. Um, uh, yeah, grew up. Went to college there as well. College in Golden, Colorado. Um, there's an engineering school out there. Um, Yep, yep, car school. Yeah. yeah, most a lot of it's like 50 50 where people know where it's from. So I just say small school in Golden where I started. Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, when I was there, I started playing rugby. I was involved with a lot of organizations and clubs. Um, so I was very involved in, in the kind of the community and in college as well. And then, uh, kind of towards my senior year i was in an entrepreneurship class and uh, at the time i was dating the girl and we were like let's for our date make beer for a rugby party and the, what they had it was really cool actually in colorado there's a place called cobrew and um, i don't know if it's still around but basically you used to be able to go in they had a very small brewery setup we're talking i think it was like 40 gallon setup which is really not i mean that would fit in your garage honestly so but you can customize everything. So we got to pick our grains. We got to do the whole process, build the recipe. So we did an IPA um, and made all the bottles for it and did the bottling. So it was exciting. But uh, during that process, we had grain coming out. And it was called mashing. So there's a process where the grain comes in, it's mashed, and then carbs come out and your beer is made. But mm -hmm. that mashed grain what's been essentially spent is what it's called spent grain gets dumped and all it is is it's just your barley minus carbohydrates all those carbohydrates are being used to uh, create ethanol through the fermentation process after the yeast is added okay. so we had all we just had a ton of uh, grain sitting there that was just protein and fiber and so I asked him I was like hey man what are we gonna you know do with this and he said we're just gonna throw it away I was like hmm and so we talked a little bit, and he told me, yeah, you know, you can go online, and there's recipes about it. It's called spent grain. You can turn it to flour. You can do a bunch of stuff with it. So I was like, all right, cool. And so I took some home, made a bunch of cereal and granola with it, uh, yeah. went to the entrepreneurship class, and we're like, hey, let's just do this for our project. Um, we'll pitch that, you know, we're going to turn this into flour, big scale, and then um, that'll be our pitch. And so the class, you have real angel investors that, sit on a board and they grade you and if you you know whoever gets the most imaginary funding from these investors that's your grade in the class and so i think we finished second out of like 25 teams or 30 teams and so the, the pitch and the, the value proposition was still really good it's the same what we're running with now but uh 
at the end of it, a guy pulled me aside. He's like, hey, man, so this is really good. I'd love to give you guys, like, real money. So maybe I'll give you guys $50,000 for 10% to start. Um, and then we can kind of see if we can get this idea rolling. So before uh, Grain for Grain and then after college, I was a petroleum engineer. And petroleum engineering at the time, oil and gas had crashed by that point, but there were still plenty of jobs. Yeah. Um, and so I was able to land one that was rotating essentially between Houston and North Dakota. And that paid uh, well. And so uh, I was like, no, man, I'm good. I'm just going to go to work. And uh, So you already had that job when he's like in the ground. I was literally about to go. I, I was going on a big backpacking trip in Asia for like a month. And then I said, oh, you know what? Instead, I'm just going to uh, uh, just go to work and then, and then figure it out later. And so... Uh, I actually moved to North Dakota for my first like few months and then moved to Houston for this program. And so I was doing well at work, but uh, at the time I was starting to get kind of like antsy and I could, I, I was itching to either change into a position or a role that let me like really just meet with people, engage with people, work on more high level like vision stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So like portfolio stuff. But, um, and so I got that opportunity and I really enjoyed it. That said, <laughs> Uh, leading up to it, I was getting really dissatisfied. So I was trying to think of like, maybe I could start a business or a side hustle or something just to get my mind going. Yep. And so I like kind of resurrected the idea again of Spend Grain. I was like, let's give this a try. We'll see. So we found two huge problems with Spend Grain that was the hindrance between this actually becoming an available ingredient. One was nobody could dry it. Um, in, a, in a time that was uh, actually cost efficient or energy efficient. And then two, um, it was very difficult to mill uniformly. So it's the grain, there's a lot of weird stuff going on with the grain, but it's very hard to turn it into a uniform flour. And so we spent basically two years trying to solve those problems. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what I was doing before and where I'm from and what led me to it. And then plus, I'm an avid skier. I'm like the only black guy on the mountain every single time. But I love skiing, um, go to Jackson Hole usually once a year, or this upcoming year or season, I'm gonna be jumping out of the helicopter skiing. So okay. I, love, I like love the outdoors and love the mountains. So it's definitely near and dear to my heart. Yeah, expert status only if you're doing heli skiing. Right. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like almost there. I'm good enough to do basically anything on the mountain as far as like getting down. I can't yeah. do, I can't do cool stuff. Like I'm not, nobody's yeah. reporting me saying, look at that. But yeah. <laughs> so. okay, so I'm gonna ask. I know I know you, I heard you say that your your parents are from Ethiopia. That's really high elevation. Is there skiing there too? Have you ever? Is that a thing? There, there's not. The only place that I know for a fact where there's snow in Ethiopia is on the top of Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's snow on top of there. I uh, Ethiopia is fairly high high elevation, but it's like maybe. Um, I probably could look it up right now, but I'm not. But it's like maybe a mile above sea level. So that said, it's so close to the equator, and you're you're talking. You're also very close to the um, Red Sea. And if I remember correctly, there's a lot of hot air that blows across, like kind of Egypt and across the Sahara, and that's where we get a lot of the storm fronts that generate hurricanes that come up to the Gulf. And so that brings in warm air. A lot of the cool air would potentially bring snow, but all of that is kind of stuck in North America, so. I got you. Okay, well, back, let, me, let me get back on track. So, you, yeah, yeah. You had, when you did this for the entrepreneurship class, did you, like, build out the whole business plan and had that, like, ready to go when you returned to it, or? Yeah, it was like a PowerPoint at best, but okay. yes, we did. So, it actually, uh, funny you bring that up. We actually brought that PowerPoint back up to actually see what is the real value proposition or gaps and that's where we realized the gap was the drying technology was just, there's nothing there. And yep. um, a little bit on the supply side, but actually like generating interest in selling it. Nobody knew what this was because nobody's ever been able to make it before commercially. Okay. So with that in hand, is this, so you're still working with yeah. your petroleum engineering job for these two years as you're, as you're doing this on the side. And yep. so... Tell me a little bit about that sort of R and D process. Like, were you <laughs> like, are you building the machines to do this? Are you like renting space somewhere? Like, how is that working as you still have a day job? Oh man. Okay. So this is, this is funny. So uh, at this moment, I'm back in North Dakota. So we, we decided, you know what? We're going to give this a shot. 
Um, my co-founder was moving to like outside of Odessa, and then I was moving. He was moving to I think Monahans, Texas, and then I was moving to uh, Minot, North Dakota. And so <laughs> Minot gets really cold. It's like negative forty-five m- most of the time. Uh, okay. And so uh, during that time, uh, I would drive two hours down to the nearest microbrewery, which is in Bismarck, which was like just directly south. So I'd leave mm-hmm. work at three p.m. on a Friday drive down, pick up the only sprint grain I could get within 100 miles, bring that back up on Friday evening, and then start figuring out how to drive or mill it. And okay. so I first started building building small dryers in my garage. And so I first started with like my oven and then tried to understand the mechanics of that. I was like, okay, the oven's not going to work. Then we went to a clothes dryer. So I like bought a clothes dryer and just kept rigging new parts or pieces to it. Exhaust filters, we'll try to find a way to add heat, mm-hmm. increase the spin, a bunch of stuff. So I was always messing with it. And ironically, it heated up our garage. So as we would heat up the grain, the humidity and the heat coming from that, that process was actually keeping our garage warm when it was like negative 40. So it was, it was pretty helpful. Um, mm-hmm. So we did that for about six, seven months, got a concept down. And then basically we then went in rather than building our own, we wanted to see if there was anything existing out there that we can then repurpose for our needs. And so started in oil and gas, and then it kind of went into food, went into paper manufacturing, and then we ended up finding our way into pharmaceutical technology. And then we're able to repurpose some of that stuff for what we needed, and then flour milling technology from a different industry we brought in. And so we basically borrowed from a lot of pieces put it together in a unique process and then that is actually what we're patenting is that process. Okay. And so I mean driving two hours right after work to get this. So that makes me think either you were super interested in solving this problem or you were really trying to get out of being get get out of what South Dakota to stop being here. So was it little economy and beer was there like what was the driving factor? Uh probably the latter more than the former we've i mean part of our pitch has always been like yeah you only just wanted to leave north dakota i was like yeah at the time i was 24 I'm like i'm yep. 24 and single i think actually i was 23 i'm like i'm 23 and single i'm not staying in north dakota okay so yeah uh it was no way out. Yeah. okay okay um all right so then so you finally get this figured out like what was there a what made you finally take the leap to say, I'm not going to do engineering anymore? How did that happen? Yeah, we, um, we raised some money. Um, <laughs> somebody said, every time I hear North Dakota, I want to say sorry and give you a hug. <laughs> sure, man. She's, the pre- she's, our, she's our president. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was, a, it was not. It was okay. I, I, I liked it by the very end of it. I was like, this is okay. Yeah. Um, and so, really, it was when we were able to raise some money. So, we got little bit of angel investment from a handful of people kind of from oil and gas and then we that was able to allow me and Matt or Matt and I to be able to purchase our equipment build a facility in Bernie and then um, begin sourcing grain and we ended up choosing Freetail as our partner um, and then uh, actually launch a Pearl's Farmers Market and so and then from there give us roughly about a year's worth of runway and so the idea was, all right, guys, this is a good idea. We're going to let you test it out. In order for us to really test it out, we actually needed the equipment to be able to produce it at that commercial scale. Yep. And so the idea was, all right, we're going to make some products. We're going to see how they sell. And so they were selling okay. The farmer's market was rough. And then, um, but then HEB is where we've kind of finally hit our stride. Yeah. So how, how did you end up here? If you were burning it, I guess. Since you were in North Dakota, yeah, you yeah. in East or I guess West Texas, like how does that work? Yeah, so at that at that time, Matt actually had moved to San Antonio, and so a, couple, a few things. One, we wanted to we were going we were looking at Denver, Houston, and San Antonio. Houston because just our network was there. San Antonio, Matt was already here, and then Denver. We're both from Colorado, and then Denver is just like a really good location for that. Yeah. Um, but then we decided San Antonio one, Matt actually, his girlfriend now wife was here. And so he's like, I really, and she's in, she, at the time she was in the army. So that would have been, there's like no way. And then two, um, 
actually, we kind of kind of tested the idea here first. We went to all the breweries, and Matt essentially pitched and said, if you can find a supply, and then if we can find a location that will meet our budget. And there's quite a few technical inputs that have to go into the, the space we need. High electricity availability um, needs to be able to be converted to food safe fairly cheaply. And it ended up working out just because Denver is very expensive. Bernie had fairly inexpensive properties. Um, and then uh, it also, we didn't really realize this, but with Whole Foods being um, headquartered in Austin and then HEB being headquartered in San Antonio and then Pearl's Farmer's Market being one of the top farmer's markets in the U.S., it all those were all secondary things we found out later. And so by luck, uh, we were we were pretty, we were pretty uh, fortunate of starting it here. Okay, cool. Okay, so we got kind of the uh, rundown on, I guess, sort of what brought you here there. Now I'm curious, because I know a big part of the messaging that you have and what you all talk about and what seems to be one of the driving parts of the organization is your focus on sustainability. So can you tell me about, like, was that literally the genesis of that when you saw that, that, that spent grain in your college project and that got the wheels turning? Like, how did that develop to become, like, a core part of the business? Yeah, that's a great question. So a uh, couple couple things. One, um, because nobody's been able to figure this out, being a first mover is pretty dangerous just because you're kind of taking all the punches to the face and letting somebody else kind of run, like kind of ride your coattails. That said, um, there has been another kind of first mover out in San Francisco. So they were making granola bars with this regrain. And so they start proving the concept, but more so just in general in the economy i'm seeing that um i'm seeing that there's going to be a lot of uh, uh like true um innovations on upcycling where upcycling can be profitable upcycling is a low um low barrier to entry as far as from like other uh product makers which will create i think better competition better innovation in that space um, a lot of this is taking byproducts, so it's very cheap um, initial cost from your supply standpoint um, or your sourcing standpoint, and then actually selling it. You can almost sell it at a premium. So there is, like, for example, for us, we're getting grains. Um, I mean, this is a byproduct from the brewery. A majority of them are throwing it away. We even are offering to buy it from breweries, and then we're able to uh, turn and add value to it. And so... That is a profitable proposition for both parties. So the brewery is able to make money. We're able to make a product that makes money. But then there are so many other benefactors from it. The environment is winning. The consumer is winning. The consumer is getting to take part in a much larger vision for improving the sustainability story of San Antonio, Texas, and as a wider story in our community. And then at the end of the day, it's a very good product too. So there's a lot of help health things or health opportunities there as well. So whether it's keto or repurposed clothes, you know, those clothes still have a lot of value, repurposed items and, and anything in that, in that kind of wheelhouse of repurposing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just so much, there's just so much on top. Uh, uh, there's just so much on top, like availability there. So. Sure. So it's like, you know, it's like, what we're talking about is like the circular economy kind of. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. I so try to avoid circular economy term just because um, sometimes it's not as it's not as true of a visual as people think. So I just don't want them to get trapped. It, it never is like a pure like this, then this, then this, then this. Um, There's so many avenues. So it could be a circular wave or a circular X, Y, or Z or something. So um, that's why I, I agree with you. I just, oh, I'm always making sure that people know that it's, it's, it's a complex supply chain. Yeah. 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 So have you, so I know you said there was another connection uh, or another company kind of doing uh, similar, using spent grain at least, um, but it's mm -hmm. not different. I mean, has your, uh, status in that kind of like repurposing upcycling thing. Are you are you looking to make connections with other organizations that are doing similar kind of ethos and what they practice business? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my my vision is that we're one of many on kind of a, maybe a platform or something, uh, some sort of like marketplace idea that um, 
essentially we're all promoting that same type of, whether it's food products or marketplace items, uh, mm -hmm. of upcycling and, and, and kind of that repurposing idea. However, um, I am, you know, we're stu super new and super focused on just our vision of trying to just make spent grain and other products. So we, we have other ideas on the R&D side, uh, mainly with like tequila makers and distilleries as well to repurpose those items or their byproducts. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for us, we're fairly focused, but yes, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, it would be incredible if there was a marketplace and there are some that exist now, um, like marketplaces similar to what you guys have promoted and, and whatnot, um, that, that we could definitely see kind of being a part of, or even spearheading as well. Okay. So, so you, you said, you mentioned like you found out kind of just the, the magic of San Antonio being near the headquarters for Whole Foods and HEB. And um, can you tell me those helped you get to where you are? What's the immediate sort of next thing for you to kind of like, I don't know, for lack of a better term, level up to, to where your the next step is that you're trying to get to? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So right now we're working on developing partnerships for our wholesale and private label. So when we started Grain for Grain, the whole idea of it was it's going to be basically an example product um, or example MVP brand. So it's going to say, hey, we have this technology and this ingredient. Look, we're going to build this brand, Grain for Grain, so that's why I'm using the circle. And here we're going to show that we can make products that you know can make uh, you know some some type of revenue and it'll, it'll get some traction with the stores, but it's all using this technology and this ingredient that's coming from it. Yep. And then five, 10 years down the road, we were going to start offering it in bulk and wholesale. Uh, all of a sudden then we started generating interest for people like, Hey, I've been looking for spent grain for years or, Hey, that's a really cool idea. We have some ideas for keto based or sustainability based products. We would love to get our hands on that. And so for us, our next step is um, a couple large bakery chains. So we're going to be launching, um, we can't make the announcement yet, but um, we're going to be launching across the state with 200 bakeries. Um, and then we're going to be creating products that are keto friendly with our flour. Um, and then also with larger, like for example, imagine if you could go to a burger place and get a keto sustainable burger bun that tastes great has like a tenth of the carbs and then, um, you know, it'll be like a healthy burger. Um, yep. and, so, and that's like made for Texas by Texas in a way. And so there, there, there are come, some of those things that we're trying to come down the pipeline as well. And then another fun thing we're trying to do is also expand the product idea, right? We're developing stuff for human consumption. What about pets or animals? And so we're working with pet food suppliers to see if that they can start taking the spent grain and use it to make pet food with it or pet treats. So anything that uses wheat, barley, or flour, um, we can fit right in the picture and it's healthier and way better. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, that gets me to kind of, uh, can we talk a little bit about, it's a replacement for flour, but it's not the same thing. So can you tell me a little bit about what's the difference between like just spit grain and say all-purpose flour? Yeah, so um, there's primarily two differences. One, uh, on the nutrition side, regular flour, its calorie makeup is about 70% carbohydrate. Ours is uh, just under 5%. It's about 3 to 4% uh, carbs. The rest of it is protein and fiber. For flour, very little protein and not a lot of fiber. So it's just, it's mostly carbohydrates. So that's the difference from a structural on uh, a nutrition standpoint. And then, um, and then really the, the remaining is that this is a byproduct. So this is a, um, a, a you know, a wheat that were, or a barley flour, like grain that was taken, um, and then was used and was going to get thrown out or fed to cattle. So for us, we're taking something that on a completely outside stream of kind of the process and bringing that into the same type of supply chain of like other flours. Mm -hmm. Oh, so the difference is the source and the nutrition. I got you. I got you. And I know I've seen on your website you talk about like there's no active carbs in the grain flour. What does that mean exactly? Basically, an active carbohydrate. Think of it as like anything that could impact your blood sugar. So I, our flour is uh, we got it tested by dietitians from the American Diabetics Association. 
So essentially it's not, it is like fiber does not necessarily have any caloric value to it. And yeah. so active carbohydrates are carbohydrates that have generally a, a caloric value. Now that's not totally correct way of saying it, but that's, I think the best way to visualize it is mm -hmm. one lot of energy. The other one is just has other ben like health benefits, like healthier digestive system and um, way better for your heart health and, and, I guess a lot of other stuff with that comes with fiber. Okay. Um, all uh, right. So, uh, so I know, all right. So we've already established that folks, so if they want to get green for green, if they want your spent flour, I know you, so you have two products right now, right? There's the flour and then there is your waffle and pancake mix, right? Yep. Yep. And where can people get that if they want to get? It? Absolutely. So, uh, the best place is on grainforgrain.com. Um, and then in the second place is on uh, an HEB. So if you go to any HEB, like kind of in your neighborhood, if you're in Texas, uh, that's mm -hmm. to grab it. Um, it's in the flour and baking aisle, both of them. Um, but then if you just type in grain for grain on Google, you'll be able to find um, not only our website, but our store on there. And then another part of your retail thing, and this is part of it, uh, y'all give away to the SA Food yeah. Bank and uh, I forget, the, there's another organization, right? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, basically uh, for our retail facing products, so our pancake mix and flour, um, we, we just love the idea of giving back. So where the name Grain for Grain comes from is that giving mantra. So for right. every four, the flour we sell, we give a pound away. And so, for example, during COVID in the beginning, we were able to, through our sales for the beginning of the year and last winter, we were able to donate enough for about 5,000 to 7,000, depending on how you do the math, meals worth of flour. Okay. Uh, we donated that to the San Antonio Food Bank. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're very much um, uh, committed to that mission. It's, it gives us a lot of joy whenever we're able to give back like that. So how did you, like, how did that start? Like, when did that, was that from the inception of the business? Like, how did you get to that part of your mission being, being sort of what you did? Yeah, it's really just my background. I've done a lot of service projects, uh, mission trips through my church. So I just, this is just like the way I, I envision that business could be run um, is, mm -hmm. it, you know, there's, it, it, there's a way to give back that's still um, equitable for everybody and all the stakeholders. And so for us, San Antonio has a huge population of people that are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Um, and so this is one way to serve the community of people that cannot afford a premium product like what we're developing. That said, they can still get their hands on it. Um, and I think it's a necessity for them depending on, you know, this, where they're at with their, with their health. So we're, we're excited to be able to partner with people like that. Okay. Um, okay, and so now if people know where to get it, they know why they should get it. Um, I saw y'all are doing, you do baking classes on your site, so that's to teach people what to do with it, right? Yep, and so that's awesome. So there's a, a lady that we found uh, named Stacy, super cool. So she had been baking with spent grain for a couple of years, and so we brought her on to kind of... Uh, like as a partner to be able to conduct the baking classes. And so if they sign up for the class, it's a three month class that teaches you how to bake with spent grain flour. There's a private community Facebook group. Um, there's a private part of our, our there's password for protected portion of our website. We're going to get access to all the videos, bunch of recipes. And then with the purchase of the class, you get three pounds of flour, which will be yeah. enough to take you through the class. So, there's a lot of cookies on there right now, and they are bomb. They are so good. I, yes, all I can say is I do it. <laughs> okay. okay, and for people who uh, maybe are not the baking inclined, they can still get products made with your flour elsewhere. So can you tell us, I think there was, uh, was it Little Gretel and Bernie? Yes, so if you're in San Antonio or in Bernie or in the, in the area around Bernie, uh, Little Gretel Restaurant, as you said, um, they have, we have a spent grain flour menu. There okay. is a, uh, you can get the breakfast, so you can get a pancake and waffle there. Um, you can get a burger made with a spent grain bun. You can get a chicken and waffle. The chicken is breaded with spent grain. It is okay. so good. And then a Monte Cristo sandwich is, uh, and then for dessert, there is an oatmeal raisin cookie made with spent grain flour. 
Okay. It's a small out menu, but yeah, Little Gretel Restaurant in Bernie asked for the spent grain option. Okay. And is there any plans to get anything similar like that in other restaurants in the area, or is that kind of like a one-off for now? Uh, for now, it's just a one-off. Um, there is definitely a, a plan to hopefully start integrating spread grain flour to other common items, but for now, this is just really a place for us to trial and air and new these. Cool. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that sums up all of my questions, Yanni. Thank you for joining us. Is there anything else that people need to know about Grain for Grain before we before we call it from you? Yeah. Uh, like Michael said, if you're really interested, just go to grainforgrain.com. There's a ton of more information on there, a cool video. And if you're interested, yeah, buy our products. We love the support from you. So thank you so much, Michael, for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks. Have a good one. Take care, man. See y'all later.